I'd like for you to take your Bibles, please, with me this morning and turn with me to the Old Testament, Psalm 139. If you would find your places there, please, to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, please. We're going to look at a few passages together this morning, so I hope you'll keep your Bibles open and follow along with me as we look into God's Word together. I'd like for you to help me pray this morning. Pray that God would touch us as we, as we get into His Word together. I'm going to be honest with you, I, I pray this way at times I've Tell the Lord, often, usually, a lot of times we meet together in the prayer room over here. But you know, I mean, I might have, I might have a message that I, you know, as far as writing things out, and putting things down, and maybe making an outline and all that kind of thing, and looking at the scripture and so forth. I, you know, study and work and do all those things, but. If God's not in it, it means nothing. I said, if God's not in it, my, my efforts are in vain. You, you understand? If God's not in this service, our efforts are in vain this morning. And so I'm asking you, I mean, child of God, those of you on praying ground, I'm asking you to pray in your heart, right where you're seated, just pray, dear God. Bless and touch. Why? Because if we don't have the Lord, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. 
but I'm glad to report to you God's alive and on his throne. And I'm glad to report to you he's still in the prayer answering business and he's still in the soul saving business. He's still in the promise answering, promise keeping business. I'm glad to report to you this morning that God's still able. And so that's why we pray because we have a very able God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. And now if you have your Bibles open with me to Psalm 139, I want you to find with me please verse number 7 in God's Word. Verse number 7, as David here, the psalmist, as he cries out to the Lord and he prays and he praises. And find with me verse 7 please. The Word of God says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea. The darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Skip down with me please to verse 23 in this psalm. Psalm 139 verse 23. David again, he's praying and he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. By the way, verses 23 and 24 are good prayers for you to pray. And I mean to make in your own heart. Not just quoting some words as if they're nothing. But I mean to make them yours and to pray that way to God. But I want you to notice with me please verse number 8. Verse number 8 is our text this morning. And I believe this is what the Lord has for us. The Bible says, if you'll notice please, in the middle of verse number 8. If I make my bed in hell. I'd like you to mark that expression, please. If I make my bed in hell. The psalmist here is making a point. He's at a place where he's crying out to God. And he's describing the fact that no matter where he turns and where he looks and where he goes, there, God, can be found. In other words, that you can't outrun the presence of God. Jonah tried to outrun the Lord, but he couldn't do it. Elijah went from the presence of the Lord, set up under a juniper tree, but he couldn't do it. God found him even there. David is talking about how that no matter where he looks, where he goes, to find the presence of God. You know this morning, that's why there are people who try their best to shut God out, and yet He keeps coming every now and again, He might just knock on their heart's door. You know that? He might just knock and get their attention. Now, I will tell you this, and and I believe the Scripture teaches this very, very well. You can grieve away the Holy Ghost of God, and you don't have a promise that if you reject Him today, that He might come back tomorrow. You don't have that promise. That's why when the Lord deals with you, you better deal with the Lord. That's why when God arrests your attention, that's the time to get hold of God. Because what if He lets you live tomorrow, but He doesn't come by your way tomorrow? Jesus said, no man cometh unto my Father, except the Father draw him. No man cometh unto me except the Father, which is in heaven, draw him. Can I ask you this morning, don't grieve away. Are you grieving away? Don't grieve away when the Lord draws. But notice please, if you would, He says in verse 8, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You see, the glory of one, the heaven, that God is there in heaven. If I ascend up into heaven, that's the glory. God is there. But the glory of one is also the terror of the other. He said in heaven, and behold, thou art there in heaven. But if I made my bed in hell, there, behold, thou art there. His face is for us up in heaven, but His face is against us in hell. There's glory up in heaven. There's judgment down in hell. But David says, if I make my bed in hell. Now can I ask you something this morning? Do you ever stop to think with me that there are people around this world that are making their beds in hell? You ever heard the old expression? He made his bed. I ain't lying. You ever heard that? In other words, somebody 
chose what he wanted along his life. Somebody chose what he would do with his life. He made his bed. Now he's got a lie in it. I wonder this morning if there are people in this church house. I wonder if there are people around us this morning. They're making their beds all right, and they're making their beds in hell. Can I tell you, listen to me, this is serious business for a man to say, I've made my bed in hell. You know something, beloved? The truth is there are people everywhere. I mean old people, young people, everywhere. They're living their life, they're doing their thing, and they're making their bed, but their bed's in hell this morning. I want to ask you, how many of you that are dear Christians this morning, you remember the glad hour Jesus came by your way and you cried out to the Lord, nothing but a hell-deserving sinner lost and on your way to the eternal flame. But yet you cried out to the Lord and you say, thank God he saved my hell-deserving soul. But I'm going to tell you there's a world full of folks out there that have never called on the Lord as their Savior. And they've made their, they're making their beds in hell. And one day it'll be too late and they will have made their bed in hell. I, uh, I'm as serious as I know how to be this morning. You may think this is funny, but I'm serious as I can be. But there's a bed. I wonder how many of them are making their beds right there, and their beds are in hell. I'm serious as I know how to be. I was reading my Bible earlier this week, and I come across that expression. It was like God just stopped me there. And I want to know this morning, how many people, they're, make, they're putting the sheets, they're putting the covers on their bed, and all the while their beds are in hell this morning. I wonder how many people might be in this church house this morning. You're making your bed, but your bed's in hell. You think you've got to live for yourself. You think you've got to have your way. You think you've got to live for self and pleasure. And what you don't understand is that you're making your bed, but your bed's in hell. You see, there's a thought that goes around this day and age where people have this idea. A loving God won't put me in hell. You know something, the reason people think that is because they don't think their sin is that bad. But even one little sin is such an affront to God that it can put me in hell this morning. I'm going to tell you, I spent years of my life making my bed in hell. I did. I spent a long time making my bed in hell, putting the, getting the pillowcases ready, getting the sheets ready, putting the covers on the bed, getting my bed ready. And what I didn't know was that I was making my bed in hell. And this business where people think Christianity is just about we just go to church, we sit a while, we listen to some guy rant and rave, and we go home and do it again next week. Brother, I'm here to tell you this thing is not about just coming here in this building. It's about trying to keep people out of a devil's hell this morning. And if you're here and you're saved and it doesn't stir you up that God has saved you from hell, there's an altar up here for you this morning. And if you're here and you're lost, you, don't, you may not know it, but you're making your bed in hell. You say, preacher, I don't like that kind of preaching. I'm sorry. That's Bible. Because the Word of God says people are making their beds in hell. Now David in this psalm, he's not saying that a saved man can go to hell. He's just expressing the fact that our God is so big that you can't escape Him and outrun Him. And he said, even if I did make my bed in hell, but you see, a saved man can't go to hell, but a lost man will surely go to hell. He's making his bed in hell. I want you to take your Bible, turn with me please, just a moment. To the Gospel according to Luke chapter 16 for just a moment. I want to talk to you about the horrors of hell just a moment. The horror of hell. In Luke 16, in verse number 19, a story you know very well. I don't believe it's a parable. I believe it's a real story about real people who went to real places. They had real names. They had real families. They had real loved ones. They had real things in their lives. And one of these two men went to a real heaven, and the other of these two men went to a, went to a real hell. The Bible says in Luke 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in people and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, 
and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. And thou art tormented, and beside all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Now I'm going to stop reading the story there, but you get the idea. This man is a man who died and went to hell. This is a man who lived fine. He lived a fine life. He fared sumptuously. He had the finest of houses. He had the finest of clothes. He had the finest of things. He had the finest cars. He had the finest of servants in his life. He had the finest of possessions. He had the finest of knickknacks. He had the finest of careers. He had the finest of all of it. But when he died, he went to hell because he'd made his bed in hell. Now listen to me this morning. What is hell like? The Bible tells us what it's like. The Bible says in verse 24, He said, I am tormented in this flame. Hell is a place of fire. I would never, you wouldn't dare. You know, no sane thinking person would dare make his bed over a nest of rattlesnakes. No sane thinking person would dare make his bed over a place that was dangerous to sleep in. No, no thinking person would sleep on something that he thought would bring harm to him. But how many in this world are putting their beds over hell this morning? Can I tell you, this man went to a place of flame. You know, people don't like hearing about hell, but I want you to know, it is a place of fire. Jesus said it's a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's a place where people go to and they would to God they could get out. It's a place where people go to and they wish they could escape, but they can't escape it because it's a place of fire and brimstone. It's a place where people will be for all eternity. They say, preacher, I don't like that. I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about how God's going to give me a good life. I want to hear about how God's going to bless my family. I want to hear about how God's just going to take away all the bad things and fill me with all the good things. Can I tell you this morning, God loves you so much. He's trying to keep you out of hell. But I wonder if you're making your bed in hell this morning. I, I realize that I'm talking to a folk, group of folks this morning that most everybody in this room, as far as I know, would say I'm saved and I'm glory bound. I realize that. But I just wonder if there's somebody that's making their bed in hell place of fire, flame. He says in verse 25, hell is a place. In verse 25, he says, Abraham said, son, remember. I think one of the most horrible things about hell is that it's a place of memory. I remember the sins of my life. I remember the times when the Lord came by my way. <laughs> Let me shut this up. I remember the time the preacher said you need to be saved. I remember the time some dear family member, some dear sick mama wept over me and begged me to come to know Jesus. Some grandpa and some grandma begged me to come to Christ. And I said, I don't want to eat that in my life. That's not for me. And all the while, I've made my bed in hell. Now, once I get there, all I can do is just think about how I could have been saved. I read a story. I believe it was Billy Sunday who told the story. He said he got it from another preacher. But he said, a dear woman, I believe it's a true story, but a dear woman, she had a large family. She had nine children, and then grandchildren, great-grandchildren. It came her time to go home to be with the Lord. She was a saved lady, and she asked for all of her children and her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, to come to see her before she died. They appointed a time. They came to see her. The doctor said she doesn't have long. She's lying in the bed. She's very weak, very feeble, but she wants you to come in the bedroom. She looked at all her children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. She blessed them in the name of the Lord. She prayed over them. She wept over them. And then she asked everybody to go out except her nine babies. And as they all went out, she started at the oldest. And he'd come and get down by the bedside and lay his head on his mama. And she, she'd pet him on the head, which a mama can do. And she said, now, son, don't fret now, son. Don't fret. She said, good night. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. The next one's come. The next oldest come. She pet her on the head. Good night. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. The third, the fourth, the fifth. Good night. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. That's what she said to all of them. Good night. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. Until finally the last one came. And that one was kind of a moral individual. He wasn't out killing people. He wasn't out tearing things up. He might drink here and yonder. But he was a pretty well moral guy as far as society is concerned. But he didn't know the law. And he'd come before his mama. She looked at him and she said, Goodbye, son. Goodbye. She 
said, Mama, you told everybody else, good night, I'll see you in the morning. Why are you telling me goodbye? She said, because Satan, you rejected the Lord. She said, that's the Lord Satan to you. I tried to bring you to Christ. She told me, no, you won't be saved. Son, I said, hope I'll see you tomorrow. He got mad. He got angry. He rose up from there. He went to walk out the door. And about the time his hand touched the doorknob, the Holy Ghost of God smote his heart. And he began to weep and to cry and to say, see, that his mama loved him and that Jesus loved him. He turned around and he said, Mama, I don't want it to be this way. I want, I want to see you in the morning. Mama, what do I need to do to be saved? She said, Son, call on the name of the Lord. And that's exactly what he did. But what about the ones that were kept lost in the nation of the there was a place of memory, a place of blame. I want you to take your Bible. I want you to turn with me, please, if you will, to John 14 for a moment. Let's talk about the escape from hell. Somebody's making their bed in hell this morning. Somebody's been playing the game. Somebody's living their life for the devil. Somebody's living their life for themselves. But I want to ask you this morning, would you like to escape? Because I'm here to, I'm here to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, the devil can take my old bed. He can have it. He can have that. He can have the memory. He can have the pain. He can have the past. He can have all of it. I'm here to tell you, I thank God I've got a new place. I've got a new life. I've got a new hope. I've got something in my soul that says that bed isn't my bed anymore. Thank God I've got a new home up in heaven. That's where I've made my bed at. I'm glad to know I've got an escape from hell. But some people don't. Listen to me. The Bible says, if you'll notice, please, in John 14, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place. I wonder if, some, I wonder if somebody in this room would like to find a place that's not a place. I wonder if somebody needs a place. I wonder if some of us, dear ones that are Christians, you've got loved ones that need a new place this morning. There's people making their bed in hell. So, preacher, how do I get out of it? Well, the Bible tells us in John 14 and verse number 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Jesus said, I'm it. I'm the way. There's no other hope for any man on this earth except through me. Somebody says, I've made my bed in hell. Jesus said, but I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I was 17 years old when God passed by my way. I was 17 when God picked me up. I was in bondage to my sin. I mean that. I was in bondage to my sin. I was getting in trouble and more trouble. I hurt people. There are things I, I would have thought I could forget about, but I can tell you one thing. Thank God Jesus still saves old hell-deserving sinners like me. And I want you to know on that glad night, it was a Tuesday night, I bowed my unworthy head at an altar. I want you to know Jesus came into my heart and life. He saved my soul. Thank God my bed's not in hell any longer. How about yours? Is it still in hell? How about you? Are you still on your way to hell? Can I ask you this morning, how many of you glad Jesus has given you a brand new place to live? How do I get there? The Bible says, you don't have to turn, but the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, repentance toward God. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what repentance is? Repentance. Excuse me. Repentance is not these one, two, three, probably want a cracker, repeat after me kind of prayers. It's not like I take Jesus like some kind of appeal. I need a little Jesus. I need some Jesus in my life. So I take Jesus like I'm taking some kind of prescription drug. Jesus isn't the pill. Jesus is the doctor. You see, Jesus isn't the stuff you take temporarily. He's the one that you need every day. You live for new life in Christ. And the Bible says we have to have repentance. Repentance is, Lord, my mind has been changed. I'm wrong. You're right. You see, my mind's been changed. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It means my mind has been changed. I'm crying out to God. I see myself as a lost soul. I see myself drowning in sin. I see myself on my way to hell. I see I'm making my bed in hell. I see this morning, I need God to help me. I want God to save me. That's repentance. I wonder how many church members, church members, I've never repented of their sin. People talk about truly repenting, genuinely. I don't believe in all that. I believe there's repentance and then there's not repentance. You repent and you say, how do you know when you've repented? I'll tell you one reason I know I've repented because I'm still repenting. 
In other words, I'm not, I haven't gone to church just one Sunday and I got a little Jesus, but it didn't last me longer than I got home. And then I'm back to living like my old self again. I'm living like the devil. Brother, I'm telling you, the Lord made a change in my life. He's made a change in a child of God. Brother, I'm here to tell you, there's such a thing as repentance. It means I don't want my sin anymore. I want the Lord. I want His blood to wash me and make me clean. He says, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus. Meaning that I'm taking him as my Lord. He's the boss. He's the ruler. He's Jesus. And I bow and I receive him. I believe Jesus died for me, was buried. And I believe the Lord rose again from the dead, alive forevermore. And you put your faith in Christ, brother. Your bed is no longer in your house. That's the escape you have. But I want to ask you about the warning. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me, please, to the book of Romans, just for a moment. Chapter number 10. Verse number 1. I was watching a little bit of a documentary recently about American history. I like history. I like American history. I like hearing about the Patriots. I like stories of George Washington. I like stories of you know, John Adams, Samuel Adams, and these men, these Sons of Liberty and so forth. I like stories about those and what they did and how they fought in the war. There was a man I'm sure everybody's familiar with. His name was Paul Revere, and everybody knows who Paul Revere was and what he did and how he rode on his horse and how he rang out the bell. He cried out, The British are coming, the British are coming. Get ready, get ready, get your weapons, hide your families, do what you need to do. But the British are coming, the British are coming. You know something, church? Thank God for a man who'll sound a warning bell. You know that? Can I tell you, I'm glad for somebody who warned me. I'm glad for somebody who told, I'm glad for somebody who was like the Paul Revere in my life who said, you need to get ready. Jesus is coming. You need to get ready. There's a hell that's coming for you. You need to be ready to meet God one day. I'm, I'm glad for a Paul Revere in my life. Can I tell you, the church ought to be like that. With the house of God, this place here ought to be a warning, a warning center. It ought to be a place where there's bells ringing, lights are flashing, somebody's getting somebody's attention, somebody's praying, somebody's weeping, somebody's saying, "Dear God, save the lost." I don't want their beds in hell anymore. The Bible says in Romans chapter ten, verse number one, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Can I ask you, what's your heart's desire? What's your heart's desire this morning? What, what's your prayer to God? I'm going to tell you, I find myself getting so cold so often while people are still making their beds in hell. I find myself just talking about it, not doing anything about it. Brother, these altars ought to be filled with tears. The prayer room ought to be filled with hungry people. People ought to be stirred up saying, I don't want them to go to hell. I'm going to sound the warning. You know, excuse me, that means people ought to be out on visitation. People ought to be out praying. People ought to be witnessing. People ought to be talking about the Lord. People ought to be making much of Jesus. People ought to be saying, I want the Lord to save my loved one. So they're making their bed. I find, I find it's easier for me. Maybe not for you. If not for you, praise God. But I find for me, it's easier for me to seem like the witness of strangers than to go sometimes my own family. You know that? That be true of me, but I'm going to tell you, it doesn't mean they don't need it. Well, somebody's got to say it. They might not like it. They may not want to hear it. They might get mad at it. Ready to get mad at it. And to stand at the judgment seat one day. Oh, I'm getting cold here. By the way, if you tell them you're not responsible for the results, I want you to understand that. If you've warned them, don't you leave here feeling like I failed God. You, you understand, when you fail the warning, when you've given out the message, you've done what the Lord required of you, they have to make their own decision. You know something? Let's, let's just get on. Churches are much too bare. Excuse me. I believe there's too many churches that are full of gimmicks. Gimmicks. And they, they ear tickling. And all they want to do is have some little guy get up here wearing a little skinny jeans, a little holes in a t-shirt, and relate to people. Brother, it's not about relating to people. It's about telling what God said the Lord. And God said those people that are making their beds in hell. I don't know this morning how many of you have got lost loved ones and people in there. How many of you are willing to sound a warning bell out to people in this community? 
How many of you are going to go out there and stand on the street corner somewhere? I went out last night to at Stanfield, but they're right, right there in front of that bar last night. I did. I went up there and just hand out a few gospel tracts to people, told people. I heard somebody over, overheard somebody saying, come on in here, let's have a good time. And I'm thinking, no, 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 that's not the good time. The good time is when you know your sins have been forgiven and your bed's no longer in hell. And tell your brother, I need to Time to say, Lord, I don't need that for you. I just need to trust you. You might be here lost. Somebody wept over you, cried over you, time to get lost. Church, you might be here saved, but it's time to put an altar. The Lord. Let's pray together. May we please all around our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.